Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is Oscar Stalberg. Uh, I make procedural things and pretty things. Uh, I come from like an artist background. I studied at the Game Assembly in Malmo, which is a school quite similar to this one. Uh, I studied art there, but then I sort of ventured more and more into technical sides and making more procedural things. Um, I used to work at Massive. Uh, I worked on the division. I made that cool like holographic map. Maybe you've seen it. Um, that was really fun. Uh, and at on um, as side projects, I've done a bunch of other like procedural interactive uh, demos just to explore things myself. But I, then I'm in the habit of putting them out as interactive demos online too. So both that little house there called Brick Block and that planet, you can find them on my web page and you can open them in the browser. And it's just like tools to manipulate a house and manipulate a, a planet. Um, that's a very good way to do projects as a student too, by the way. Just like make things that you can publish so you don't just publish screenshots or videos, but publish like interactive things because they're so much more likely to be shared and it's so much more impressive. Uh, so do that. Um, yeah, as I said, I worked at Massive for a few years. Uh, I worked at us to Malmo as a Unity dev for a bit too. But uh, now I'm indie, making my own games. Uh, well, trying to make my own game, one game. Uh, it's called Bad North, looks like this. It's what I'm working on right now. <coughs> but today I am going to talk to you about uh, a procedural algorithm that we are using to generate these levels. It's called Wave Function Collapse. I didn't name it Wave Function Collapse, so uh, you know, don't ask me about the connections and quantum mechanics. But this is like a GIF I came across of so this guy, uh, Maxim Gumi is the guy who invented the concept, or I mean, he based it off of something else too, but I think he like, did the bulk of the invention there. Um, so as you can see, it's, well, the way he did it is a way to use like a small example bitmap and then create a larger bitmap that's consistent with that. So what it really does is like deriving adjacency constraints, like which pixels are allowed to be next to which pixels from the example, and then it can create something bigger out of that. So obviously my first idea when I saw this one was like, I'm, I bet you can use this for 3D, I bet you can use this for other things than just uh, uh, textures to build, build larger works. Because it, it, it tied in very neatly to like some problems I, I had looked at before, like how to make nicely varied, uh, sort of content agnostic um, procedural algorithms. So yeah, this is the first little thing I built with it. It's supposed to be, uh, all right, yeah, there we go. Yeah, these, I had to download these as, like half of these are just like old tweets that I downloaded again and put up into the, you should follow me on Twitter to post about these kind of things all the time. Uh, but this is like my first implementation of the wave function collapse that I built. And as you see, it, what it does, it, it, it's applied on like a triangular tiled model on spheres. Um, one in the middle there is like, uh, so villages, roads, quite similar to the planet I did before, but it can also, it can do some things that that planet couldn't do, like some ways of making roads, because that planet didn't have roads, for example, because they like are a bit different data-wise. Uh, but you can also make it do like weird things. You see this guy's just like building sort of sausages onto uh, uh Yeah, out of like, and you can imagine what the triangular tiles for that would look like. This video doesn't seem to load, but that's just another point like, tile set. So the core idea is that you just you just give it a tile set, and then it figures out how to assemble that tile set into one coherent model or environment. So like whatever constraints are implied by how your tile set fits together, it will solve for that. So if you give it like. Um, if, if, you, if, you, if you have not build a ton of transitions, it will just figure out a way to build the environment with those transitions that you have, that you have uh, built. So this is another early example of what I did there. So you see it's like building a little sort of city block, something like that. And um, these, like to the left there, that's actually all the input modules being used. So it's, it's not too many. It's quite quick to get started with it. Uh, and then, you, yeah, it figures out how to put it together into different things. Um, and this, I, I think this, because since the algorithm is, algorithm is like content agnostic fundamentally, like it doesn't know that it's building a house, it just knows that it needs to fit things together. It makes it, like as an artist, you can build all these nice little sort of 
transitions between things, and you can build like extra little things that use the same. So, like you can build a chimney, and you can build a uh, like I, ha I have some larger <laughs> some sort of larger features of like uh, things going up here, these little sort of divider here. So yeah, you can build things like that, and then it will like create larger structures from it. Uh, so now I'm going, and this is another thing I tried to build. This is actually this is what became Bad North a long time ago. It looks like this, and you played a little cat. It jumped around, but then that that all changed. It turned out, and this is an important lesson. It was too colorful. It's very hard to put gameplay on top of an environment that's very colorful, because then the gameplay needs to be even more colorful, and like the UI needs to be even more colorful to grab the attention. From that. But it's also just an example of the kind of variation you can you can get from from the algorithm. Um, so now we're going to get into sort of the specifics of the algorithm, how it actually works, and has any of you looked at the, uh, this algorithm before? A few people have. That's good. So my hope is here that actually, has any of you built one yourself or tried to? So a few people. That's really cool. So my hope is that actually, like, if you've been interested in it, you you should from this presentation be able to get going and start sort of. Uh, I understand the core of it. So this is a very simplified version of it that's made specifically for presentations. Uh, so you see here, here's like the input modules, uh, and here is like a big possibility space. I call because there's a bit of ambiguity when you talk about tiles. It's like is a tile where things go, or is a tile what you place there? So I split up the terminology into modules and slots. So like mod, each slot picks a module. That's the terminology. So right now. You have everything being possible, every single module here being possible inside each slot. And I can just quick solve, I'll speed up, Whoop. So you see it like constructs different uh, <coughs> environments that are that are consistent like out of out of those input modules. And this like this particular set of modules, because the algorithm can fail in some cases, but with this input this set of input modules it, it can't actually fail. because uh, it's too simple. There are no like weird dependencies built into it. Uh, and the way it works, let's start by like deselecting. So now I will I only feed it two modules, only two modules possible: full sky or full dirt. So obviously, since I don't have any transition between those modules, I don't have any tiles that have like both sky and both dirt. As soon as I select one of them, everything turns into sky, for example, or everything turns into dirt uh, because there's nothing like there's nothing to connect the two. But if I add like this little connector here, right? So it's dirt at the bottom, sky at the top. Uh, if I select sky here, yeah, everything above it and in line with it has to be sky. If I select dirt here, yeah, everything aligned with that and below that has to be dirt. But here it's still a bit ambiguous. But as soon as I place the uh, the, the like the top line part there, then like the entire thing collapses down. So the way oh, uh, all of those. And of course, yeah, you can, as you see there, like here it errors because it can't solve it because it doesn't have any modules whatsoever. If I just give it like a corner module, it can't solve it either because there's no way to build a Korean system with just a corner module. If I give it corners and sky, then yeah, it can put a corner or a sky piece there, but, but that's it. Um, so the way it uh, sort of, because I built like, a, you can see the solving happening in a little time slider here, and th this is also available uh, online, so you can you can uh, open this little thing and play play around with yourself. As I click a piece, so the core idea is that yeah, you have this huge possibility space where everything is possible everywhere, and then as soon as you place something, what you're doing is not really placing something, but what you're doing is you're removing all other possibilities from that tile until there's only one remaining, and as those are removing, though they look like if you have one that has like sky downward pointing, if, and you remove that one, and that was the last one that had sky downward pointing, then in the slot below it, it has to remove everything that relied on having sky downward, so everything that has sky upward. And then you know that might have further implications and has to remove some other things that relied on those things. So since this is like, a, I don't have any overhangs, so as soon as I place something with dirt, it knows that everything below has to be dirt, right? You see how it created this big dirt pillar here, and I was going to make a similar dirt pillar here, and in between, because I don't have anything that would fit in between there. So that's a, that's a recursive, uh, like I don't have to, because obviously the first naive approach, and that's a 
completely fine way to start with it. It's just like when you have made any change, just check the consistency of every single tile. Like, are there still adjacent possible m modules that would satisfy like these constraints? Uh, that's a perfectly fine way to start, but then you can then you can build it in like a smarter way where like as soon as you remove something, it, it checks was I the last of my type that was removed? And if I was, then like let the slot next to me know that hey, there's nothing matching this anymore. And that goes, okay, that means I have to remove this one, and then like that propagates through. Um, so if we if we for example might go for oh maybe auto solve. So you see how like it paints this little. So this is all like recursive. It's all it's all implied from one of them, and it just uh, picks the first one. So it looks like a display snake, basically. It's pretty easy. Um, in this particular case, the the because this is just a two D picture, so you can derive your adjacency constraints depending on. Um, you know, what kind of tiles and modules you're working with. In this case, I'm just working with a picture, a pix, a picture, and it's not a very complex picture. So I've derived that by just like, you see if I click this here, uh, some other things light up too. So like if I click this one, see this is like side sky. This is like top and bottom sky. This is like side dirt, top and bottom dirt. And it derives those, uh, in this case, just by sampling the texture on three points, just getting what's the color here, 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 like along the top edge, what's the color there, 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 getting the color, just turning that into a hash, uh, and then you know everything that has the same color in those three spots will get the same hash, and then you can index that too, and then it's all very simple. So, so this, the little numbers you see here is actually that, that, that color on that point in uh, like hex values, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, it's helpful if it's somewhat readable to you, because then you can compare, oh, I thought these pieces would fit together, but then you can look, oh, no, the color is actually slightly different because they accidentally did something wrong. And of course, you can round off those things before you put them down into hashes too, uh, if you want to avoid, uh, if you don't want to be too tedious sort of with the uh, errors. Um, yes. So yeah, uh, the core, and this is, so this is an example of, there's a bigger field of programming that I didn't know when I got started with this called uh, constraint-based programming. Um, and it's sort of the idea that instead of, you're writing an algorithm by, you're starting with just declaring what are the constraints here, like what things are allowed together with which things. In this case, of course, this is strictly adjacency constraints. So it's just what things are allowed to what things. And then, like in all constraint-based programming, you just like ask the algorithm to give you a solution that satisfies those constraints. So you have the constraints, which are like hard rules, and then you can also have heuristics, which are like okay, but when there are multiple options, right? Like here, it doesn't know what to do because obviously, like it can put anything anywhere. Uh, but then you can have heuristics that help, like oh, you know, add probabilities. You can have that random picking with noise and things like that too. Uh, but yeah, so this is one example of, of constraint-based programming, which is a very useful. Uh, way of writing code and like writing rules in, in general. So that's the simplified version. I also made a little, where did that go? There we go. I made a little just schematic to show like an even simpler version. This one doesn't move unfortunately, it's just a picture. But uh, you can see how, like here I just have two types of sites. I have zero and one, and zero is grass, and one is uh, road. Uh, so I have two slots, so it's a very, very small system, and each, in each of these slots, four modules are possible, and here we can see how, how they rely on each other, right? So how, like, the, this road piece, this piece here, and this piece here, both rely on this little piece here, right? So if I would remove that piece, then, like, this line gets cut, and there's nothing feeding into this anymore, so then it tells the next one, okay, you now need to remove this one and this one, and then like those two would get removed and it would collapse down. So yeah, big possibility space and then collapse down in resolving uh, implications of your constraints. And then I'll show you how this actually works in our game. So let's do that. No, that's something else. There we go. So this is Bad North, a uh, game we're making. Uh, and I'll show you, I'll, Go ahead and generate some 
new levels. This is like a campaign map that now I've turned on to you, so I can just like auto-generate whatever I want here. So I'll pick a level, and the generation is going to happen. So here we can see these just like the wireframes of all the modules that would be possible on all these uh, in all these slots. So if we let it play, it's mu it's much slower now, by the way, because it's visualizing it as uh, and generating. It's, it's very it's much much faster than. So you see it's sort of building a possibility space first, right? Because it needs to do that. It needs to propagate everything everywhere. And then it needs to resolve initial initial constraints. Because the previous one we saw, it didn't have any initial constraints. Anything can go anywhere. But here, like, I need to have sky on the outside. The level can't all be inside dirt, right? And I also, it's island, so I need to have water at the bottom. So that, like, initially implies a bunch of constraints. So you have a bunch of things being removed right here. Somewhere around there, yeah, now we've resolved the basics, uh, the basic initial constraints. So you can already like start to see like the, the shadow of the shape of the island. Uh, here you have the first thing actually being placed. Uh, it's, it's, it's a house, it's a hole for a house because the houses get add, added later because they're not part of the train. Um, and you see how already like some options around the south side of the house started disappearing because obviously like, there's already implications for that. Uh, we'll let it run a little bit further, and you see it's like adding new, placing new things and resolving constraints. Uh, so like here, it started adding an edge, and there we see like the shadows. Like now there's a gap here because there's nothing like that would be possible to place there that would um, that wouldn't conflict with this edge here. So you see these sort of this sort of ghosts represent. Yeah, and there now it's all generated. <laughs> So it start, it's like, as it gets going, it gets faster and faster and faster because most of the implications have already been resolved. What was that? Was it this, this one? So then we can have a look. Oh, I think that's a different, yeah, that's a different one. But this is like what a result might, might look like. We can, uh, let's try and generate another one. Yeah, so you see it's like getting constructed. So possibility space is expanding. That's one of the slowest parts, and now it's getting really slow, like placing all these, because there's obviously like, a, I think around like 100,000 possibilities, because there's like a, I don't know, there's like a few hundred modules, and then uh, it places one on each tile on like rotated a mirror or two, uh, and then, oh, that's actually really slow. Let's just turn off the rendering for a little bit. Now it's starting to collapse it. It's a bigger level, yeah. And of course, as with a lot of procedural things, the, the generation time uh, incre increases exponentially with size. So the bigger the bigger the map, the slower it is. Um, though we obviously solve that by playing on small islands, so that's a good solution. <laughs> So yeah, it's starting to shrink it. Like you see some shadows disappearing here that like aren't allowed just by the initial initial implications. So. Really slow to draw all these. Yeah, and now it's start like some of the initial ones. It starts placing placing tiles, and this also really like one thing that's interesting. Uh, a big problem with procedural generation in general and with this technique in particular is like since the technique, the core of the tech doesn't know what we are generating, but I need to generate playable levels, right? Like where you can actually go all the places where you have to go. Uh, that actually took me a while to figure out how to do that in a good way. Obviously I can, after I've generated a level, I can go through it and like validate, like, has, like can you go from the beach up to the house everywhere where you're supposed to? Uh, that works, but obviously you can end up generating a bunch of levels that you just sort of have to throw away. Oh, look at that. That's a bug, I think. Please. No, 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 it's a hole. There's a cave inside here, but we won't be able to see it. Okay, it's not a bug. Um, yeah, so they're creating another level, another level for us. Uh, it hides them when they generate them, because this is like, it's supposed to happen sort of offline at campaign map time. Not really go into them. Uh, but yeah, but so the way we did with navigability is you see these green lines here? Like the modules uh, have a very simplified idea of 
um, how you can navigate from them. So this is like a flat area, so it knows that it can go to adjacent modules. Um, so when, when I generate, I, I, this is like the heuristics I was talking about before. So when I get to pick, because sometimes it's just implied and you just need to place a module somewhere because nothing else is allowed. But sometimes you, you get to pick, like especially when you start with an empty canvas, you get to pick which modules you're supposed to place where. Uh, and that, then I drive this with like a navigability heuristic. So I start with one place that I know is navigable. I start with a house. And then it tries, it tries to pick tiles that expand that navigable island. So you see how it keeps like building with these sort of with these uh, green lines outwards. There we go. And here actually it starts. Here we can see it, it's complaining that uh, these levels don't have enough beach, so it discarded them and tried again. So it had to do that three times. Um, that's also an interesting question of like backtracking in generation in general. Like, would you when you make an error when you run into a contradiction? Do you go back and then try something else, or do you? I tried that a bunch of times, but the thing is that you don't know how far back you have to go. You don't know if you like. Maybe the error was implied in the first tiles you placed. So in my case, I solved it by just I saved the initial state when it's resolved all the initial contradictions, and then we just if something fails, if it runs into a contradiction, it just reloads reloads that and collapses again. It's way faster than than, than trying to backtrack. Yeah, we'll collapse one more island. Make a, a big one. I actually built this visualization like yesterday. Uh, so quite happy with how like you get sort of shadowy view of so you can sort of see how the, the sort of way they implied. Uh, possibilities, and you see, you can tell also that of course, like keep here in the corners, there are way fewer possibilities even in the in the beginning because there can like there can be a corner corner beach, there can be a little rock in the water, and it can be water, but that's basically it because it's a corner, right? And that's all like that all gets implied by, by just by the initial contradictions. This is a taller one, so I guess yeah, here we can see the the sort of uh, the navigable network being a little bit more interesting, or we should be able to once we start building that work. Yeah, you see like here, it's sort of a little stair going on here. So this <coughs> navigable network goes up like this, and then it goes down, right? So it keeps, and this green box like encapsulates the navigable network. So the way, it, the way I do this navigable heuristic is like, if a new tile would increase the size of the navigable box, then I, that gets a high score. And I pick that one. Oh, then we one. Yeah, uh, and we can have a look at all the pieces I'm using for this. So this is like all the tiles I'm using. Um, they're a bit unshaded, but we'll put some wireframe on them. So it actually like now there's a ton of them. I think there are just about like 300. So that's a lot. But it just started out with like maybe these ones, something like that, because this algorithm, as I said, since it solves the constraints, it's like, because with a lot of com these kind of combinatorial things, you need to create a lot of different permutations, which is a pain. But since this one is driven from the content, instead of the content being placed to sort of satisfy the, the um, sort of higher level abstractions, so for example, voxels or something like that, you can get it going with very, very few things. It will just figure out how to build structures for that. Um, so I started with something like these ones, just to get a sense of right. If they're really important things, like what's the like, what do my edges look like? What do my slopes look like? What's the corner? Of, like, how much detail do I want? Right, because that's a really important part. Um, but then you know, it's really easy to just keep adding new content, and you can choose yourself how many, like how much permutations you want to add. Like these are all my sort of little staircases, which like obviously you need a ton of those for all kinds of situations. Uh, but there are some other things that can sort of occur on just sort of one-off locations, like this little rock here that just goes in the water. There's another rock that just goes in the water. Um, and I also added a little tool so you can check uh, adjacency. Uh, so here, is, uh, if I just highlight the sides of things, other things get highlighted that, that fit with that thing. So this little side bit here, of course, fits with all the other little side bits. 
Uh, that's really useful when you author new content and you need to check I built some new things. Does it actually fit with the last things I built, or do they like accidentally fudge the vertex in Maya and now like it's off a little bit and nothing works? So this is completely automated, like check. Yeah, yeah, this is automated. Yeah, that's a that's a because I I really detest like keeping a good structure in my Maya scenes uh, and like naming things and things like that. So what I do is I on, when I import the FBX to Unity, I just merge it all into one. And then I go through and cut it up into little pieces and analyze the edges of it. And, and it can also make bigger pieces, because this is quite an important part, uh, aspect. Um, like you can make, right? So this piece here stretches across two tiles, which is, that's a super useful thing to use just to sort of break up the obvious tiling, of course. Uh, so I still, like, I don't hide the tiling. You can see in the game that it's clearly a tiling game. But you can still like just like sweep around corners a little bit more. Like those things are really nice, so that you sort of keep them on their toes. They don't know exactly what's going on under the hood. Uh, it's really good for those things, and it's also, of course, uh, crucial for making these little staircases because they have to like you have to go from one level to another one. So obviously you need that. Uh, here you can see also these the little green lines. Here is the the, the sort of pieces of navigable network that it's using for that. Um, for the navigability heuristic that I used to expand it. And the way, the way it does too, when I, when I uh, import them to cut it up into pieces, the way it figures out which one are supposed to go into small pieces and which ones are supposed to go into bigger pieces, it actually checks, like, does this have a triangle that spans over to another tile? And then it just merges those into one. So I, it's, it's all in how I model them. So I need to place all the like it doesn't actually cut the mesh, it just takes all the triangles and then puts them into different tiles and then like figures out if some of them go together and then they get merged, uh, which is super. I have some more examples of just like those sort of rounding, right, like this little bit here, just has like a, it just rounds off an edge a little bit and just makes things a, a bit nicer. And this little plane here, actually move the, you see how the middle vertex is just moved to the side a little bit Could this, to trick the thing in, to thinking that this is just one big plane instead of cutting up into little planes. But um, yeah. And so one thing artistically I'm quite happy with here, if you look at a corner, uh, it's slightly asymmetrical. It's like this side here is a little bit smaller than this side here. And that's a very easy way to get a tiny bit of variation. So like on top of like a pillar, that if you pick four different corners and some of them are mirrored, then like there are a bunch of different ways that those could look like. And also it means I can add these little nice pieces, which are sort of adapters, that where I can add like a bit of a crack, which is like a piece of detail, but that's also sort of meaningful in the way that it, it flips the, it mirrors the orientation, right? So it's thick here, but thin there, thin there, but thick here. And that's, I think that's a nice way of thinking about detail in general, like making detail that's, that's, that's meaningful, that keeps changing things. Uh, Keeps changing things. So if, if we have a look at a, let's have a look at the generated level here. Yeah, I wanted to mention also something about the, because there's obviously a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of technical things going on here, but there's also a bunch of aesthetic things going on here. And you can tell that the, like, the interesting thing is not what happens with, like, on surfaces, the interesting thing is what happens where surfaces meet each other, right? Like if I would just have a, like a super obvious tiling grass texture here, that wouldn't, like that doesn't really provide information, right? We sort of, yeah, we get it's grass, but like, it, uh, so the stories, instead the visual stories are being told where surfaces meet each other, right? So the first reading obviously is like the grass patches, like where are those levels? And then we have the, the little edge you got here between the grass and the, uh, uh, and the cliffs, and then you have another little edge where, like, the convex, where you put the I put these little grass things, which also like break up the tiling a little bit. Those are procedurally placed, of course, the, the grass patches. Um, and then you get these little sort of yeah. Here you can see one of these little mirror adapters being used just to like so you have a you have a line like normal normally a corner is just a line, but then sometimes it shifts and there's a little bit of a crack in it. So that's a good here too like. Soft line, but a little bit of a bump in it. It's a, I think that's a nice approach to detail in general. You don't need detail everywhere. You need detail to smell, to tell small stories, and usually like in transitions, 
between things. That's what details should do typically. Um, yep, yeah, I think that's sort of uh, most of the, and that of course keeps tying into, because like if we put some units on here, it's slow when you have both these open. It's also the idea of right the, where the environment is a is a canvas for the gameplay. So the environment should like the environment should be beautiful, but it shouldn't have that many details because the details should come from the gameplay, right? And it's the same. It's also with these units because in this particular game, of course, you control small armies instead of uh, individual units. So each of the little each of the individual units is quite simple in its aesthetics to sort of. And the focus is being put on how they move as a unit instead. So you're supposed to be even like that instead. And of course, the the islands are also quite literally a canvas for the gameplay in that you do they do get painted quite heavily with blood as you. <laughs> as you um, yeah, that's sort of it about. Oh crap! Next door. Yeah, it, the game isn't completely frame rate independent. Unfortunately, because I didn't know that much when I built, started building it. Uh, so when it's a bit of a lower frame rate, some of the units start jumping around a little bit. But yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so that was it from my presentations. So any questions from there? is doing sort of sort of cubish so like um, it's cubes and the modules are cubes but you distort them to fit together so sometimes you have five court like five cubes meeting in one corner sometimes you have three cubes meeting in one corner I think you could and then you like just distort the tiles to fit them in there I think you could make really beautiful sort of medieval cities and things like that with like curving roads and things like that with a system like that because uh, I, I find when you build um, because different tile structures sort of work for different things, right? Uh, triangles, so that's hexagons, right? Because triangles and hexagons are related. Are really good when you make, uh, like for like the planet I showed first, for example. Uh, when you have bigger terrain shapes and, and like cities, they're decent for too. But for houses and smaller shapes, that's quite hard to do with triangles. That's much easier to do with, with, uh, with cubes, because that's sort of the structure and shape they have. But yeah, you can do it with whatever grid you want. You don't even have to do it with a grid. You can do it with uh, like a completely arbitrary graph. Um, and you, you can mix it, right? You can use both triangular tiles and uh, square tiles and cube tiles. You, yeah, you can two-dimensional, of course, or whatever. Yeah? Um, in the 2D example, you showed like uh, that you choose one of the tiles yourself, yeah. one of the models yourself, and then the rest generates around it? Yes. How does the game like choose which direction to go in? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that's of course that approach in general is called a mixed initiative approach, where like you as the user have some initiative and then the algorithm has some initiative. Uh, the game isn't mixed initiative at all. Like the that's all just being picked randomly. Both because of course as you saw in the example there were like sixteen options. In the game there's like three hundred options. So like how would you present that? Uh, I'm sure there is a good way to make a proper inter I mean, I'm sure there's a really good proper interactive tool in this, but I haven't built it. Um, so no, the game, the game just like picks them according to different rules. Uh, it starts with houses, for example, because the game need, the game relies on there being houses. And also, I have a bunch of things to drive it. So I have like themes. I have some boxes around these. Uh, which like have names and they ha can have different rules. So some things, for example, have rules that they're not allowed to be next to themselves, like copies of themselves. Quite an important rule is for modules, I don't want to be next to a mirror of themselves because that usually looks quite bad when you have two mirror pieces next to each other. And it happens quite often because, of course, a piece fits perfectly next to the mirror of itself. Um, but I also use these for themes, right? So I have some, uh, like I have some cave parts here. This is like the caves. Uh, which I only use for some levels. And then I have some like, uh, 
some like ruin structures kind of. Oh, where did that go? Where did the world go? I don't know. There we go. Yeah, it's, this is not my normal workstation. Uh, but yeah, I have some like ruin type uh, shapes too that I use for different, and I, then I have some with like some big boulders and rocks and things like that. This is actually, this level here is a, is a rock theme, right? So you see, I have this little nice little overhang here where you can, uh, so it's like a bridge you made by a little rock, and you also have these little pillars here. So I have some themes like that just to keep you, I mean, that's also always a challenge with procedural generation that think, things can look too samey. Uh, and this is one of the ways I, I, I approach that. I mean, obviously also switching color schemes, switching foliage, things like that, but also picking from different types of time. It's pretty basic, but yeah. Yeah. Maybe one more question? Yeah. So uh, you're modeling most of the modules yourself by hand in mind? Yeah. Uh, did you try procedural approaches for those modules? No. Uh, no, I'm sure that's good. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot to be named there. Uh, it's everything's so low poly here though, so modulating it myself is, I mean, like, it's just a few triangles. Uh, so. Okay, I guess one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, you said, like, uh, for one of the islands, uh, the algorithm has to restart twice because they didn't find enough uh, features. Yeah. But when you <coughs> generate, can can you like do you do you shift uh, the weights of the different tiles you're gonna put or are or do they stay the same? Just they are just restrained from the other from the neighbors. Uh, I mean, there's both. I mean, the risk, the adjacency constraints that's a hard constraint, right? That always has to be satisfied. Yeah. But then there's also probabilities, and I, I can put boxes around things and say like, hey, the tiles within this area should have a slightly higher or lower probability. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Uh, but the, the the beach thing that happens afterwards when it's like it's this algorithm is done and then it's constructing the nav mesh and then it's checking like is there enough beaches where ships could land and if there's not enough then discard the island and start again. But it can fail er earlier than that too, and it can fail like there are, there are a few validation steps after generation and there are a few during. So if it closes the navigable island, so the 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 network it's building, if that's if that gets closed before it reaches the bottom, for example, then you know there's no way this island could work, and then I can discard it before I do any of the any of the other things. So, uh, starting. 